How many of you remember the game show uh, Let's Make a Deal? It was popular back in, you know, in the 60s and 70s. It's kind of come back in daytime TV lately. Um, but especially near the end of almost every episode, there's this, you know, at the very end, there's the big, you know, the big deal. And it's kind of set up with you have three doors, right? You have door number one, door number two, or door number three. And you have to choose as the contestant which door you want. And you hope there's a huge prize behind the door that you've chosen. Now, sometimes there's an okay prize behind a door, and sometimes behind one of the doors there's what they call a zonk, right? It's a gag gift. It's not a real thing. It's a fake trip, you know, or it's fake currency, or it's, you know, maybe a donkey or a horse or whatever. And so you don't want to choose that, but you don't know what's behind any of the doors, but you have to choose one. And there's even this mathematical thing. It's called the Monty Hall problem. Maybe you've heard of that because he was the original host of the show. And so the Monty Hall problem is literally like high-level math, and so it said this, so when you choose one door, he will give you the option to change if you want to choose one of the other two instead. So mathematically, according to the Monty Hall problem, your odds increase if you switch your option to one of the other doors. I don't know how that works. I tried to look at the equations, and honestly, my daughter's sixth grade math is hard enough for me as I'm homeschooling her. And so high level, if you get a lot of letters into math, then I'm out. You know, that's not my style. I want to read the letters, you know, in a paragraph, not equate them in a math problem. But that's how that game show works, door number one, door number two, door number three. And on the show, it can be very exciting, you know. But how many of you ever feel like life is sometimes that way? And it's a lot less exciting sometimes when we have to choose door number one, door number two, door number three. Our lives are always filled with options and decisions and choices and what do I do. And it's not game show pressure. It's real life pressure because we don't want to make the wrong decision. We don't want to open or walk through the wrong door. But it can many times be difficult to figure out what is the right move to make. What of these options is best, which is better than the other. It can be hard to figure that out. And especially if you're a Christ follower, it's not just that I want to do the right thing, but I want to do what God wants me to do. So you almost increase the pressure a little bit as a follower of Jesus, even though he gives us all that we need to make those decisions even more than without him. But it still adds a little bit of that pressure. I don't want to disappoint myself or my family. I don't want to disappoint God. I don't want to get off track. And so sometimes we have a hard time figuring out what that is. Is. There's a lot to consider, a lot to weigh, and if we're honest, it can be overwhelming sometimes. There's a lot of confusion that can come in life. And so we're going to look at that today as we talk about what to do when we don't know God's will. We've been on this discussion. We'll be in Acts chapter 16 again today. We were last week, but we're going to look at it from a different angle. Last week we looked at sometimes clearly when you're trying to discern God's will for your life or the next step on your journey in life, sometimes it's obvious Sometimes God clearly says no to this door or no to this decision, like we saw, and we'll read it again in Acts 16. You go this direction, it just doesn't work, or you have this figured out, and the plan fails. Sometimes God says no to what we think we want because he has a better and a bigger will. But sometimes it's not that easy. And again, sometimes there's an obvious yes, I want to do this. God's obviously opening the door. I'm going to walk through that. Uh, but sometimes it's, I'd say, much of the time. It's not quite that simple. It's not quite that clear. And so we're going to look at what we do when we don't know God's will. So this is actually the second week in a series called Collide. We're following the Apostle Paul through his second missionary journey. And they're just now in Acts 16 just trying to get started, just trying to find out, okay, we've been here and here and here. Where are we going next? We've got all of the rest of Asia and all of Europe out there. Where do we go? And so we'll read the same text that we read last week, this week, and look at it again, again, under um, the idea of when we don't know God's will. So let's read it, and then we'll kind of unpack it today. Acts 16, we're going to start at verse number 6 again, and here is what we read. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia, but again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went, through, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there, pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave from Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. So as this ministry team is getting started on where they're going to go, there's a lot of uncertainty. 
there are sudden changes in direction, changes in itinerary. We feel like we're going to go here, but that didn't work, so where do we go now? Let's just go this direction and kind of see what happens. So as we look at this account in Acts 16, we're thinking about trying to discern God's will for our lives. I want to try to help us see it a little clearer. Now, it's going to be a little frustrating because you're going to think, well, I'm trying to equivocate and I'm trying not to say things for certain. But there's only, there's only so much certainty at times we can have when it comes to God's will. That's kind of the main idea. I left the cat out of the bag early, so I guess we can just dismiss now, okay? But I think we can, what we can see from this passage and from how God works, there are there are four instructions, I think, that we can follow to help us to better understand what God's will might be, okay? Four things that I think will help us to better know God's will when we don't know God's will. So here's the first thing that we can see here, and I think we see in Acts 16 and in other parts of Scripture as well. When you don't know what God is saying, you can know that God is speaking. Now, hopefully that helps relieve a little bit of stress automatically, Okay. When you don't know exactly what God is saying, you can know that God is speaking. So Paul and his team here, they know they are called. They've had the hands of the elders laid on them. They've been commissioned by the Holy Spirit. They've already gone and done some things and seen some results and fruit of that. They know that they're called. So they know that God has spoken. They just don't know exactly what he's saying at the moment. They know that they are in the moment where they're supposed to be, but they don't quite know yet where the next place is going to be. So they know that God has spoken and is speaking, even though they can't hear exactly or understand in the moment what he's saying. They know they're fulfilling God's plan for them, even though they couldn't always hear exactly what he's saying. They know that he's speaking. And the same is true for you and for me. As you face the next big decision in your life, even the next maybe small decision in your life that builds on another one and another one and another one, we can know that when we don't quite know exactly what God is saying in the moment, we can know for certain that God is always speaking. Now, that might sound honestly a little mystical. God speaks. God is speaking to you. God will, you can hear God's voice. That might sound a little mystical. And so you might think, well, what does that sound like? What is, God, if, you know, is it like you hear in the movies, a big booming voice? If so, I would think his will is going to be a lot more obvious than it probably is most of the time. So God could do that, and he has in a few cases, but I would say it, I don't want to limit God, but I would say it's probably going to be pretty rare, or else this wouldn't be as big of a problem as it seems to be for most of us, okay? So the Old Testament book of Job, of all places, kind of helps us to understand in many ways how God speaks, so Job is a man from the Old Testament from really maybe pre-Abraham times, even though it's written in the middle of the Old Testament. So Job, it says, is a righteous man. He loved God, and he was very wealthy. He had a big family, but tragedy befalls him. He has tons of suffering that he endures. His crops are destroyed. Um, his family are killed in weird ways, and then he's stricken with this terrible physical disease on his skin. Basically, everything in his life is turned upside down in a matter of moments. And so as he's sitting there, he's sitting there, it says, for a week in silence, basically in mourning, in a heap of ashes. He has three friends that come to talk to him and visit with him. And at first, they sit with him in silence for that week, which we need friends like that sometimes, too, that will just sit with us, okay? Um, but then, after that week, he basically cries out to God, and it's just, he's almost like, you know, it's a wonderful life. He says, I wish I'd never been born. He actually says, it'd be better for me to never have been born than to be dealing with this. And then his friends kind of go through these conversations with each other, and his friends don't give great advice. We won't get into all that, um, but, but they're, they're not super helpful. And so then, at near the end of Job, though, in Job, Job 33, a fourth man comes. His name is Elihu, and he gives pretty good advice. He gives pretty good insight to Job's situation, and he's the last friend that speaks before God speaks at the end of Job, which is interesting, but I want to read part of what Elihu says because he tells us a lot of the ways that God can speak even to us today. So Job 33, let's start at verse 13 and look at part of what he says here to his friend Job. He says, so why are you bringing a charge against him? That's against God. Why does he say, why why say he does not respond to people's complaints? For God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. He speaks in dreams, in visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they lie in their beds. He whispers in their ears and terrifies them with warnings. 
He makes them turn from doing wrong. He keeps them from pride. He protects them from the grave, from crossing over the river of death. So Job's friend Elihu encourages Job, God does speak. You've been sitting here wondering where God is. Why did he do that? Why is he silent? Why don't I know why this suffering happens? And by the way, even after God speaks later on, Job still never knows, is never told why the suffering happened to him. God, so you think, okay, God told him at the end. No, he doesn't. The whole point of God speaking at the end of Job is, hey, I'm God. I'm in control. You don't have to know every detail. And that's pretty much what God says. Now, the way God says it is beautiful and eloquent, and you should read it. It's powerful and amazing. But his friend Elihu says God speaks. He says here God speaks again and again. The problem is people don't recognize it. Again, I think if God spoke all the time in a loud, booming, audible voice, we wouldn't have to wonder as often, what is God's will? So clearly God doesn't do that much of the time, really, if almost any of the time. But he does give us these ways in which God can speak to us. He says dreams and visions. This also might sound strange, but maybe you've experienced that even in your own life. You've sensed something in your dream, and, you're, and it keep, maybe it keeps coming back. It's a recurring dream. God might be speaking to you through that. God can do that. Old Testament, New Testament, it's in both of those. So the prophet Joel talks about in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your old men will see visions. Your young men will dream dreams. I think I got that backwards. Uh, the young men will have visions. The old men will dream dreams because they're asleep more. They're old. Okay, maybe that's why the old men have dreams. I don't know. But Joel talks about it. And then Peter, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, in his sermon, he says, this is what Joel talked about. It's happening now. And then Peter and, uh, the, and, and Paul, certainly, they have visions and dreams that direct them where they're going to go. Even here in Acts 16, it says Paul has a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, hey, come over here and help us. And that's how they knew where to go next. God can speak that way. Now, not every dream, okay, not every dream is from God. Sometimes it's the NyQuil that you took to get to sleep, okay? Sometimes it's, you know, the, the ham sandwich you had the night before. So we want to be careful. It's hard to discern that, but God can speak that way. He also says God whispers. This is hard to discern, I think, sometimes too, but not to, get, not to go too long here, but uh, I've had two experiences in my own life where I have, I've sensed this type of way God speaking, whispers. And for, so for me, and we kind of shared this a little bit with our high school boys last night in our small group, most of the time, well, both times that this has sort of happened with me, God's voice sounded like Stephen's voice, okay, which that might sound weird. I'm not saying I'm God. I'm saying that God can speak through a whisper through your own thinking, your own mind. And I think predominantly that's probably how he wants to do that. And you're going to know, I think you're going to discern, though, because this is the first one. So the, the, I was called into ministry at age 16. So here's the thing, though. Both times this happened to me, I was in prayer. So it wasn't random. It wasn't like, you know, knock me out. Like I was in that mode of trying to hear from God. I'm in this conversational posture and mode hearing from him. So 16, pastoring was not on the radar. It's not something that I had planned to do, wanted to do. Sometimes I still don't want to do it, but, you know, here we are anyway. And that was half, that was half a joke, guys, okay? Um, but I had this, I sensed these words, you're going to preach the gospel. Now, it sounded like me thinking that, but I knew I, that's not from me. I do not have that desire. I do not have that plan. That's not something that I, you know, just want to do. So, but I sensed that, and even though I tried to push it aside, I kept hearing that same thing. And then I'll tell another story later on uh, where that happened again. But so it's a specific phrase or instruction that you're going to think or feel. It might sound like you, but I think it, as we get more in tune with God speaking to us in that way, we can understand sometimes God will whisper to us to discern what his will might be or what that next move might be. He goes on to say this. He sometimes terrifies us with warnings to turn from wrongdoing. Sometimes in your life, you get just a feeling that something's off. You're about to do a business deal. And you just don't feel good about it. That could be God speaking to you. You're about to sign a paper to make a big purchase, and you're like, oh, I don't know. That could be God speaking to you. Or you're about to hit send on that email, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I should. That could be God speaking to you. You're about to send that text to blast somebody, and you're like, oh, maybe not. That's probably God speaking to you, okay? He terrifies us with warnings to turn from wrongdoing. Sometimes it's just a sense, a check in our spirit, in our heart. That's just saying there's something off, something smells funny here. If you sense that, just hit the pause button. 
Okay? Don't sign the paper. Don't take the meeting. Don't buy the thing. Don't send the message. Just take a beat. Pray for more clarity before moving on. And I know sometimes there's a timetable involved, and so sometimes that, that check that we talked about, that we're talking about today, might mean the no that we talked about last week. Sometimes it's going to be a pause before it's a full out, just stop the brakes at the red light, okay? So we want to sense, be sensitive to that sense in our spirit, in our heart, in our mind, because that could be God speaking to us. He also says in Job that he keeps us from pride, which is a similar feeling, but it's more of like our conscience kicking in there. Sometimes we're doing something or we're about to do something and we have this check, okay, what's the motivation here? Is it honorable or am I just trying to get noticed for this thing? Is this about me feeling good or is it about me doing just doing a good thing for someone else? What's the motivation? Sometimes God can keep us from pride by just t- giving us that check in our spirit. And then another way that our, I think our conscience and the Holy Spirit works is the last thing he says there, he, he protects us from the grave and from death. Sometimes God is going to keep us from avoiding sinful, destructive, terrible behavior. No, not door two. No, 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 no. You're just going to sense everything inside. He's going to be pulling you away from that, you know, uh, in some in some way. The Holy Spirit works that way. His conviction works that way. Now, so I want to be careful, though, when he says he keeps us, you know, from the grave. Sometimes doing what God's will is the more dangerous option. And Paul is perfect example of that. Okay. Paul could have picked a much more posh life other than traveling the world preaching the gospel, but that was God's will. So even though Job's friend says he, we avoid uh, the grave and death, it doesn't, it, I think it means more those sinful behaviors that are destructive, sometimes, because sometimes God's will is less safe. It is more risky, but it's still what God wants us to do. So when we, we can get some sign and, and have some navigation here, that again, even if we don't know what God is specifically saying, we can know that he is speaking. And as we listen for his voice and become attuned to him speaking in whatever way that is for us, we can be more certain, I think, at times of what his will might be for us, what that next step might be. The second thing I think we can pull from Acts 16 here is this, is to understand that faith is not hide and seek. Faith is a GPS, okay? We see this in Jeremiah 29, verse 13. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So to understand, even though you may feel like Job did, God is distant, God is silent, like what's the deal? Just know this, God is not hiding from you. He's not saying, ha, you'll you'll never find me now. That's not God's heart. That's not his intention. God is not playing hide and seek. It's more like the, the map app on your phone. And sometimes, Kim pointed this out to me recently, sometimes on the, the map app on my phone, it doesn't really let me know that this turn's coming until, like, I'm right on it. You ever had that before? And I'm like, oh, I, there, maybe there's two streets really close together, and I think it's the second one, but it's the first one. And so I'm like, no, no, it's the, and then I'm like, oh, no. And so then I've got to kind of backtrack, or I've got to go around the block, or I've got to, you know, find another way. Sometimes sensing God's will is that way. I think, you know, that there's two options that are really close together, and I feel like maybe this one's it, but then God, I'm trying to follow God's will, and I've passed that great job op- opportunity. Like, well, I thought that was it, but it's maybe this next one, or I, uh, this, this issue that I thought was going to work out in this way, and God's like, no, we're going this way. Sometimes it's like the map app on your phone. God's not trying to hide from us, but it's a journey where it's, it's following this GPS. Sometimes serving Jesus can be that way. Sometimes we have to reroute recalculate. That's okay. Don't panic. Don't freak out. Don't worry. Just follow. If you have to go the long way to get back to where you missed because you were supposed to take that turn, God will get you there. If it takes a little bit longer, that's okay. God will get us there. We see that in Acts 16. Paul wanted to go to Ephesus straight west at the very beginning here. It wasn't until three years later when he followed what God wanted that he got to Ephesus on his third missionary journey. God will get you where he wants, it, where he wants you to go if we will simply just follow him. And sometimes when you're driving, I don't know if I should admit this, but sometimes you almost like zone out, especially on the interstate. You're just kind of like, I'm just going straight for 316 miles. And then I have to take this exit, and guess what? I've zoned out, and it's mile, mile marker 317, and I'm like, oh, no, you know. Sometimes in life we're that way, too. We get really comfortable in this mode, and God's like, nope, there's a turn coming, but I'm zoned out. Oh, there's, there's a change coming, but I'm zoned out. Oh, there's something ha- going to happen, but I'm zoned out. And sometimes we miss that exit, 
It's, it's the same way. Sometimes we, we miss that. It's okay. Let's just get back on track. God's not hiding. He's not trying to say, aha, you messed up. Your will is crushed now, you know. I'm done with you. That's not how that works. Or sometimes you're in the middle of nowhere and you lose reception, and you're like, oh, boy, I thought I knew where to go, but now I'm less certain. And I don't know if you can tell. I'm not super great with directions. I'm glad my wife's not up here to confirm that. She'd be, amen, you know. Um, and so I need the map app. And so if we ever lose, you know, where we're going and I'm unfamiliar, I'm just, I just start to sweat, you know. I'm like, oh, no, we're never going to make it. We're going to get stranded out here in the middle of nowhere. Um, but Abraham from the Old Testament sort of had a similar thing where he's kind of almost flying blind here. Let's look at it really quickly. Genesis chapter 12, we see this from the patriarch Abraham. Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, make you famous. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. That second part sounds amazing. You know, I will bless you. I'll bless those that bless you. You'll be a blessing to the all of the earth. But what does that destination require? Back to verse 1. He says, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. So this huge pivotal moment in Abram's life, leave everything I know, everything that's comfortable, everything that's convenient, and go to the land that I will show you. Now notice, God didn't say, you just stay put, and eventually I'll tell you where to go. No, he says, you go now, and I'll show you. God says, go, and I will show and so Abram here is going without knowing. And this passage in Genesis 12 is personally personal to me because that's sort of how we got here, really. You know, so 12 years ago, I guess it was, you know, God planted this seed of starting a church in my heart. And it's kind of through that second time, that whisper, having that sense, this is the next thing. So, but I had this little piece here, you know, basically the go part, and then I will show you where you're going or what you're doing. And so a few months later, after God spoke back to me, Kim, he confirmed that in Kim's heart. So we knew kind of what, but not where. Um, and we were open to going anywhere, open to hopefully at the time staying where we were in Texas where our kids were born and life was great and everything was wonderful. We knew pretty quickly that wasn't it. And so we eventually had to figure out where we're going. And so about a month, it was February of uh, 2013, I guess, um, God revealed, he, again, kind of in a, one of those moment kind of feelings, those, that, just that sense um, God leading us here to Kansas City. And so we knew now, okay, we know what we're doing, and we kind of know where we're going. And so we talked to our pastor and told him what God laid on our heart, that we're going to be moving. So we set a date for the middle of May. And here's the problem. Just like Abram in Genesis 12, we have, we're going, but, like, it's a week before moving, and we don't have a place to live. That's kind of, you know, not great. And like right, like a week before, like the week we're moving, we finally find a place to live. We have everything packed up. We got the moving company scheduled. We have a date. We're out of here. We're moving, bro. But we don't have anywhere to live until like the last second. And even when moving here, we didn't have jobs, which I don't recommend uh, doing that. If you move somewhere, you might want to have a job in place before you do that, especially with two young kids. But, you know, we were young and dumb, and we just did that. But, we, but again, we knew God said go, but we didn't know really a lot after that. We just wanted to be obedient to whatever he was doing. But here's the cool thing. Every step of the way, when God said go, but you don't know, he was faithful to provide exactly what we needed in that moment. So right at the right time, the right jobs came up, and right at the right time, every, every detail worked out. And then the next year and a half, we know we, the right people came along to help you know, start the church, and that was almost 10 years ago. Every step along the way where God said to do this, he didn't drop the whole download of the whole master plan. Like, I still don't have a whole master plan of the next, you know, I don't know, like 10 seconds of how this is this supposed to look. You know, I'm just kind of sometimes flying blind all the time in some ways. But, with, you know, God says go, even if you don't know. And if we're faithful, we know that he's faithful. If we just simply follow where he's leading on the GPS, he will get us to where we need to go. God wants to be found. It's not a game of hide and seek. He's not trying to keep himself from you. He's just wanting us to follow where he is leading. So here's the big secret to that, okay? If today you will follow God's direction, you'll know where to go today. And then if tomorrow you will follow God's direction, you'll get to where he wants you to go tomorrow, and then if the next day you follow step one again, then you'll know the next day. And eventually you'll get to the destination you were so worried about months or years before. That's not really a big secret, is it? It's kind of like, you know, it's sort of a scam that I just did there. But it's true. It's one day at a time, one step at a time, one instruction at a time. 
Faith is a GPS. So here's an encouragement. Don't fixate over the destination. Focus on the direction. Okay? Don't fixate over the destination. Focus on the direction. What's the next step? Not what's 28 steps down the line. That could change. What's the next move? What's the next thing? What's the next instruction? Step by step, day by day, moment by moment, God will get you to the ultimate destination he's got planned for you as we just walk in step with the Spirit. Faith is not hide and seek. It's a GPS. Here's the, here's the third idea here from Acts 16, and this is a good one. This may be my favorite one, okay? Join the search party. Join the search party. There's three parts of this that I want to break down here just for a couple minutes here. Number one, search in the search party. This is kind of a repeat of last week a little bit, but again, you're not going to get the full download of God's will all at once. So since that's true, don't give up as search for God's will. Here's how Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks the door will be open. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not, unless you're David. And then you might give your child a snake because he loves snakes so much. Anyway. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus doesn't say ask one time and expect the full download. And if not, then you have every right to be mad at God. He doesn't say just seek for a little while. And if you don't figure it out, then you can just give up and it'll still happen. No, if you knock on the door. Now, that's, where, that's the one we talked about last week. If we're knocking on the door and it's a no, then don't then find another door and knock, knock, knock until that's a yes or a no, okay? He says keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Sometimes the next step in your life will come quickly, easily. Those are nice. Those are just asking those moments because they are rare, but they happen. Sometimes you have several steps that happen in a row. You build some momentum. God's doing some stuff. Things happen quickly. That's great. But then sometimes, again, we talked about a second ago, you hit a straight stretch of highway in your life where nothing's happening, like you're driving through central Kansas. Whoa, that's like a terrible, I mean, maybe you, you know, don't think that, but it's, or different parts of the country, they're just really boring. There's nothing to see, nothing around for miles. Sometimes in life you hit that stretch. That's okay. That's okay. Just keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. I believe for this job opportunity, I'm still believing I've been waiting on an answer from God. I'm going to keep waiting. I've been praying for healing. I'm going to keep praying. I've been praying for family and friends who are far from God. I'm going to keep praying. And I'm going to ask, not only, God, would you save them, but God, how can I be of service to you in that request? How can you use me in the meantime? God wants the best for you, and he wants to answer you. So we, we search. We keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. But it's not just that you're searching on your own. And your search for God's will or the next step in your life, don't search by yourself. Make it a search party. Make it a party. We have this example in Luke chapter 5. There's, there's one time where Jesus is teaching and preaching in a certain place. And Luke tells us in verse 17 of Luke 5 that there was an unusual power on Jesus that day to heal people. So there was a paralyzed man somewhere near in that town. He had some friends who either had heard this news or were there and saw what was happening, and they go get their friend like, we got to get him to Jesus ASAP. And so they get him to Jesus, and they're trying to get him into the, the building, and the building is crammed, people outside. There's no way they're going to get him in. So what do they do? They get him up on top of the building, on the roof, tear some tiles off the roof, and lower their friend down to Jesus. Jesus forgives the man of his sins and heals this paralyzed man. He gets up and walks. You need friends like that. You need friends who will get you closer and closer to Jesus. You need those relationships. You need, you know, those people, you need the people who are as passionate about you discovering God's will for your life as they are for their own. That's who we need in our lives. Because here's the reality. Friends fuel your future. One way or another, for better or for worse, friends fuel your future. If you surround yourself by doubters, you'll become a doubter. If you surround yourself by apathetic people, eventually you'll become apathetic. If you're surrounded by complainers, you'll become a complainer. 
If you surround yourself by negativity, you will become negative. However, if you surround yourself by encouragers, you'll become encouraged. If you surround yourself by people who are generous, you'll become generous. If you surround yourself by people who pray, you'll be some, become someone who prays more. As you surround yourself with people who are filled with faith, you'll find that you're filled with more and more and more faith. We need these friends that fuel our future. Don't seek God's will alone. Uh, you need to get people on your search party and get on their search party. That's the importance of what this is. It's faith family. It's an important part of your spiritual growth and maturity. That's why I encourage small group involvement. I'll tell you, even in our, in our Sunday small group in the last month, we've had two people who have pr we've prayed with them about job opportunities, and God's revealed that next step to them. He's opened the door for them. That, that can't happen in isolation. It can, but it's better done in community. When we can come together with other people of faith, other like-minded people who believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, God can do some amazing things. So it, it, don't do this alone, but join the search party. But remember, here's the last thing on this point, and then we'll move on. We're not... We're not leading the search party. We're joining the search party. Here's what it says in Proverbs 3. We know this verse very well, but let's look at it here. The NIV, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So yes, it's your life, but it's God's leading that we're looking for. Yeah, it's your journey that you're on, but it's God's will that we're searching for for our journey. And again, back to last week, you know, Jesus himself even prayed, God, not my will, but your will be done. That's the whole point. And Proverbs tells us to trust God, to lean on him, to submit to him, and he will make our paths straight. And you might get to that last part and say, wait a second. That's not what we looked at in Acts 16. That's not what we're talking. We're talking about a curvy path. We're talking about left turns. We're talking about hills and valleys. I don't, I don't know if I buy that. So let me look at the, the New Living Translation. I think describes this better, translates it better. It's the, the verse 6. It says this. Well, I'll read the whole thing again. It's short. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Because I may not know at the moment on my own which path to take. You on your own may not know which path to take, but it says here, God will show you which path to take. If we trust him, if we depend on him, if we seek him, he will show us which path to take. So don't quit your search before it's over. Don't search alone, and don't try to lead your own search party. We're not in, I'm not in control of my own life. If I'm on the search party, and I'm, but someone else, you know, God specifically is leading that, I can feel more confident in getting to where I need to go. So join the search party. Here's the last thing I think we can do. And Paul writes this one uh, in Romans 12. We can... I think more easily discover God's will as we mind our mind. Mind your mind. Here's what Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 2. He says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I, I put this in the New King James because this verse has a lot of personal meaning to me as well. So a good friend of mine, Robbie, from uh, college he, he I, you remember the Gap sweatshirts, the Gap hoodies, you know, from the store? So I, I had one of those in college. And he took this verse, the last part of that, the good, acceptable, perfect will of God, and made that, and he called, so he would call me all the time, he would call me Gapwog. Good, acceptable, perfect will of God. He turned that into Gapwog. Whenever he'd see me wear that shirt, he's like, hey, what's up, Gapwog? And so I always think of him when I see this verse, especially in this translation, because that's what we're trying to find, right? We're trying to find God's will. The good, acceptable, perfect will of God. That's what this whole thing is about, trying to figure out what that is. And Paul says here in Romans 12, one of the best ways to do that is to mind your mind. Allow God to continually renew your mind. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you have new desires than what you used to have. You have new passions than what you used to have. Hopefully you have a new perspective on life than what you used to have. So Paul says you can't think the way the old you thought to get where God wants you to go. You can't discover God's plan for your new life if you're living in the old life. It doesn't work that way. We can't use the same methods and modes that the world does to discover what only God can get us. And so Paul would say here to think selflessly, others focused. Think spiritually, think long term to think seriously, which was with a greater purpose. 
I think to sum it up in a rhyme, I didn't intend to do this, but it turned out this way. What Paul is saying to us is, if you mind your mind, God's will you can find. Anyway, you know, that just happened that way. If you mind your mind, God's will you can find. Now, that's more easily, more often, okay? There's a key word in this verse that I want to close with and, and show us the importance of what we're looking at here. The word that I want to look at is this word prove. It's in the New King James, prove. Um, it's, this, it's this Greek word here you can see on the screen. Um, Dokomazo is how you pronounce that word. And there's two main definitions to this word and how it's used here in Romans 12, verse 2. So, dokomazo is to test, examine, prove, scrutinize to see whether a thing is genuine or not as metals, or to recognize as genuine after examination to approve or deem worthy. And if you look at the, this definition, if you look at different translations of this verse, you'll see different words in that definition used interchangeably in there. So, we're proving something. But what, go back to the verse, what are we proving? Paul says we're proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So think about what that definition of that Greek word is in this verse here. So this is not an instant thing where God gives you the full download. He says as, you, as God renews your mind, we're better able to test what that is. We kind of, you poke and prod at what that is a little bit. You learn what his will is. You discern what his will is. You begin to recognize God's will. It doesn't sound, though, like the same thing as just knowing God's will, does it? But it is. And much of the time, that's as clear as God's will gets. And we see it here in Acts 16. Let's look at one more verse, the very end of this section in Acts 16, where we started, and see how this plays out. As they mind their mind, they are led in the right direction. Catch this, Acts 16, verse 10. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there, right? Paul doesn't say, God clearly audibly told us and pointed to the map, here's your next stop. He says, we decided after having concluded this was the way to go. They were testing God's will. They were poking and prodding and trying to discern and learn what it might be. We're, okay, we're just going to go this way for a while until God says no, and then he said no, okay, well, then we're going to go this way until God says no, and then he said no, okay, we're going to go this way, and, and then God kept saying yes, yes, so they knew they were going the right way. That's how it works for Paul, that's how it works for me, it's how it works for you. We test his will, it, it, it's proven over time, not in an instantaneous download of all the information for the rest of your life. You get this sense of this direction, and you just have to kind of trust God and go with that. You get a feeling in your spirit, this is not right, so in faith you don't go that direction. That's how God's will works. I wish it were more clear than that, but I think that's why these four elements are so important. It helps us to test, to learn, to discern what God's will might be and help us to go in the direction that he's leading us on our journey. We can know that God is speaking. He is leading. He's given us one another on the journey to go together, and he's given us this renewed mind to help us to better and better discern where he's taking us. And so what happens sometimes as we close, I get, and I've said that before, this is for real this time, sometimes what we discover in our renewed mind as we're walking along this GPS, you know what you sometimes discover? You were walking in God's will the entire time, didn't even know it. God was leading me down this path. I didn't even realize it. That's what this renewed mind can do. Open us to where he might be leading us so we actively, obediently walk in God's will, even sometimes if we don't know what God's will is. That's how amazing God is. Let's pray this morning. God, I pray that we would increase in our awareness of you, of our need for you, of our our desire for you. Help us to increase also in our sensitivity to what you're trying to do in our lives. The sensitivity to where you might be leading us, what that next step might be, what that next decision may be, what those options are that we can weed them out and work through them as you lead us and guide us, as you speak to us, as we have faithful people around us to help navigate big decisions. We don't have to do it on our own. You're with us. You're leading, you're guiding, you're speaking. Others are there to surround us and encourage us uh, to follow your will. And we know that as we have this renewed mind, we can kind of test what that is. We can get a better sense 
at moments, at times, in seasons where you're taking us. It may not always make sense. It may not always fit what we thought we were going to do or what we even want to do sometimes, but help us to just trust your will, to trust your leading and your guiding and to hear your voice and then to test and prove and discern what your will might be. I do wish it were easier at times to know that, but help us to get better and better as we practice the art of hearing your voice, practice the art of following you just faithfully, not worried about 10 years down the future, maybe even 10 weeks, but can we just worry about today? Can we just follow you this moment, this season, this step, and then the next one and the next one as you faithfully lead us and guide us to our destination that you have planned for us long ago? God, I pray that we would be people who would hear your voice and follow your direction in our lives each and every day to get us to where you want us to go as we live out your will. Amen.